Hey everyone, got a, another book review. This time it's going to be The Immortality Key, The Secret History of the Religion with No Name by Brian C. Murarescu. M-U-R-A-R-E-S-K-U. Really good book. I say that about all these books, but um, I do mean it every time I say that. Well-written, clear, uh, it's first book by this author. He was a lawyer, has always kind of been interested in history, the classics. He got his degree, I want to say possibly a PhD. I think it was a higher level education degree of some sort in the classics. So classical literature, author speaks Greek, Latin, Italian, a little bit of Spanish, and is able to go through and speak clearly and concisely and knowledgeably about ancient Greece, ancient history. He is well versed on going through and keeping up going through the archaeological literature, keeping up with, you know, if, if something was found uh, in an ancient Greek site and published in an Italian journal of archaeology, he because he reads Italian, is able to sort of parse that information and connect the two with what the English-speaking world is aware of. So that's the background of this author. And because he's a lawyer, he's a clear speaker, makes very good arguments within the book. The The point of the book, the thesis of the book, and it's, it's radical and it's wild. I'll just give you a taste of it, and then if you're interested in this, you should read the rest of it for sure because it fleshes out the argument very well. Part one says there was a wine that the ancient greek tradition the the uh it was a psychedelic brewed wine and so when you see like the god dionysus drinking wine they're not drunk they're having a psychedelic trip and so in that way they could experience death before actual death and in that way it's the key to immortality so that started the uh, the secret history of the religion with no name uh, as per the title of this book. And then in part two, the go, author goes on to explain and connect this idea of the psychedelic brewed wine with the early idea of the, of the Christian church. And so the, he makes the argument that the early Christian tradition, um, the Eucharist, which is uh, symbolically in most churches, the blood of Jesus, which that's what it represents, and you consume the blood of Jesus, as well as the body of Jesus, which is represented by the bread in the Eucharist, whereas the Catholic Church has the idea of the transubstantiation, in which the leader of the church, the priest, literally transfigures the the, the wine and the bread and physically into the, the blood and uh, body of Jesus Christ. And then you consume it, and you you don't quite get the power of God, but you are able to, you know, you're, you're thereby saved. I think we're all familiar with this, you know, sort of modern-day American audiences, um, English-speaking audiences primarily. You, you guys know about this background. I've participated in this in many churches throughout the world. Um, so anyway, the author, I mean, that's a crazy thing if we just linger on that point for a second. The author is trying to argue that based on archaeological findings and you know, study of the classics, that this ancient wine was psychedelic in nature, and it's had a high impact on how religion was formed, you know, sort of paganism into the Roman Empire, and then into the early Christian church. And so this was insane to me. This was like, you know, he's making the argument that the early Christian church grew in popularity, despite its secretive nature, um, because when they would consume the body of of god of jesus that they would experience um they would basically trip their asses off and get into you know a psychedelic experience i mean and and the book makes the argument compelling and and he does say that it needs more research but it's not total nonsense and as i've ex- explained many times on on videos that you've seen from me science doesn't prove or disprove things it just points us in the direction of could this be possible well let's look let's look into it and that's how a good hypothesis is made you can certainly find no evidence for things throughout history but in this case i from what i can read and interpret for i take all ideas kind of at their face value 
and I like to think and extrapolate from there, but not say for sure this is true and live my life as if, you know, I read this book and therefore that is how the early Christian church operated or for sure ancient Greeks uh, would travel to the island, the Greek island of Icaria and consume psychedelic substances and experience ego death. And then they would come back and that that's the start of their religion. And that's what they believe the gods to be. That's what it says in the book. And that's an interesting concept. And I like playing with that idea and seeing if that makes sense. But I, I don't take it at, you know, I take it on its face. I don't take it as the truth. And, and certainly when I was reading through this book, a critique came to my mind that it was like, is this backed by other literature? Would other classi- classical historians agree with this take? Or is this guy kind of off on his own in, in crazy territory? I, I don't think that to be the case. And it, as he explains early on in the book, um, in part one, the first few chapters, the day of the classics is kind of, it's, it's you know, first of all, it's a slow-moving academic field. It, there's not a whole lot of innovations happening. It's not moving. It, it's not, it's sort of past its heyday. And the dominant figures of the past, you know, in the 1900s that studied ancient Greek, Roman history, they came out with textbooks and sort of authoritarian, authoritative texts saying this is the way it was back then. Don't argue with us. And you sort of have a few, one or two, and he goes into their names in detail uh, because the author uh, speaks with certain classicists, historians of, of the cultures we're speaking of, and they had the hypothesis that the ancient Greeks had psychedelic wine when rituals that they are participated in, which sort of constituted a religion that has such not been named up until this point. So, you know, the author isn't just coming up with this on the fly. He's he's working off of the work of certain professors in the past. And bringing those to light is an interesting and fun idea. And especially in the, in the day and age that we live in, you know, right now it's 2022 as I record this. This book was published in 2020. And research on psychedelics is is happening. Um, it's that, that kind of got my mind going too. It's like, is this, we're talking about all of history. So did psychedelics, were they highly used back in the day, intentionally used? Or is this just a fun book to read in this moment because psychedelics are sort of talked about more than they were since the 60s and people are sort of comfortable with the idea somewhat of, okay, maybe ancient ancient people sat around and did psychedelics and then found out the secrets of the universe. And then, you know, that's how they gave us so much to our culture that contributes to the world today. Okay. Allow me to take a step back and explain how I was introduced to this book and where I, you know, found it in the first place. So I found this author. I listened to him on a podcast before, uh, some minutes into the podcast, I found the topics he was covering to be very interesting. So I picked up the book and I read it and it was amazing. So that's why I'm sharing the ideas on this channel. I found this author, Brian C. Murarescu, on Lex Friedman's podcast um, after I listened to um, American Cosmic author, last name Pasulka. And she was very interesting. She talked about religion and UFOs. And I found this individual, uh, Brian, um, and he started off talking about ancient religions and religious ideas in general. He spoke about, him and Lex Friedman spoke about mystical traditions, um, how to participate with divinity, what is the ancient thought process on how they communicated with the ancient gods, you know, what were they? Um, how did they participate with those beings that were divine, with um, the things that are more powerful outside of your mind? And so when I started hearing this author discuss these topics, I thought that was just extremely interesting because in modern day 
viewpoints, we are not in touch with the divine. We are, uh, you know, something that is beyond ourselves is sort of grounded in reality. It's maybe pictures from space, like the Hubble telescope, um, or maybe it's things that happen on a large scale environment. So things that affect countries or politics or things that affect large groups of people, like some a popular movie that kind of gets popularity among the people that's what people are interested in those are things that are above our individuality um oh i guess that's another thing worth saying is that individuality has become you know what's what's the end user experience like and we all put ourselves in that seat so you know social media is catered to the individual so we spend our time on sort of we don't spend a whole lot of time on on how to get in touch with higher spirits higher beings do they exist are uh, modern day you know more people are knowledgeable about things that happen in the world and because we have more input going on from outside we have lost the ability to believe in miracles because physically they don't seem to be true so when you read a biblical story let's say you're you're living in the 19 in in year 1900 and you either read the story stories from the Bible, or you hear someone in church, like a preacher, speak about the stories from the Bible. You're more inclined to believe them because your amount of data that you can you don't know what ancient Jerusalem was like, you don't know what um, the ancient Egyptians were like, you don't really have a good grasp on history. But today with the internet and with the way media, the landscape is, you can pick up on more and realize that, okay, when Jesus Christ in the Renaissance you looked a certain way um, because there were Renaissance painters that painted the all the Bible, all the stories from the Bible per the Catholic Church. So the most popular, you know, the Renaissance, you have people with a little bit more free time it's still in the medieval ages, but it's right after the medieval ages, right before the age of science and reason, you had this weird period, mostly set in, in Europe, uh, Italian centric, the Renaissance, where you had Leonardo da Vinci in around year 1500, who starts coming up with all these, you know, isn't limited by science yet, and is sort of fueled by the church to paint to draw, to commission a lot of artwork, which happens to be, you know, the Catholic Church is the one with all the money and all the sort of attention from all the crowds and the people that show up service, you know, mass uh, every day or at least a few times a week. And they're church leaders. So they put together all this art, which displays the biblical stories. So fast forward that to our modern day person or a person from 1900, the amount of information they get when they hear from the pulpit, from the preacher that uh, certain mir miracles happened, they are, were inclined to believe it. And up until, you know, the 80s or 90s or early 2000s in America, religion and church attendance was sort of rising or was steady, but since kind of millennial generation has been around and grown older i think fewer and that's my generation fewer of us go to church and that loss of community and i think some of it has to do with you have more information you have the internet out you can um, verify that miracles do not happen in modern day world so we've lost touch with divinity so when people speak about topics of how the ancients thought about things before the age of reason i'm inclined to listen in on those conversations so in this podcast that i heard mystics see all things with god and sort of see god within all things they encounter divinity within which is something i'm interested in because um, i really sort of resonate with buddhism and buddhism is you know i've i've felt uh, anxious and depressed and, you know, a normal range of emotions that have 
you know, I've kind of been lost in moments of my life and I look around for how, how does someone get through these very negative times? How do you get through the bad times? And a lot of people do it through religion and religion. A lot of it is the community aspect. I've never been inclined to seek communities when I'm feeling uh, negative emotions. I tend to prefer to look inward and say, what can I do differently? How can I either focus on the problem or focus on solutions for the problem or learn to not focus on the solution? So, you know, if you have constant intrusive thoughts of a negative nature, um, whether it's like, you know, I hate people or this person's annoying or I hate myself or I don't like the way I look, you know, all these things, that these intrusive thoughts we have about ourselves that don't really serve us. How do we help solve those? And something about that is looking outside of yourself, getting in touch with a spiritual nature. And that, that is the use of religion. And that's something that we've lost um, sort of modern day American culture as a whole. Um, that's what encounter with divinity within um, Buddhism in particular uh, speaks to that. And there's a whole Eastern tradition about that. Um, they, they spoke about in this podcast between Brian and Lex, archaic techniques of ecstasy. Um, how do they, how do people die before they actually die? That, that was a big theme of what they talked about because death is imminent. It, it's looming as far as we can tell 100% of it happens to 100% of people. How do you face death head on before you actually you know face it so is there a way that you can get in touch with what happens after you die can you get you know a a certain you know i'll take buddhist thought on this is the the soul of the essence of the person is still around even after their body dies because you're thinking you know you're a fit you had a family friends you had an impact on this world and those people will remember you after you um physically die and they believe that kind of they don't really believe in time uh if you get really deep into buddhist uh philosophy they think time is sort of a point in time and we, the way we are experiencing this is through a lifetime that feels you know 70 80 90 years but in reality it's just one point and all things happen simultaneously but um the the ancient greeks had their own view on this so eternal mysteries that are the center of our being. Um, the Upanishads spoke about us as the creators of the universe. And the author and Lex Friedman spoke about how our ability to engage in meditation is a part of our divine nature. It's getting in touch with our spiritual self. We are the creators of everything we see around us by virtue of the fact that we're sitting, living, seeing, breathing individuals, we are in some respects conjuring the world around us, um, or at least looking at the world around us, and in some ways we're interacting with it, and that interaction is an act of divine creation, which I think is a very interesting idea. There are a lot of mystical traditions um, about unlearning, so it's you go through life and learn many things, but if you sit and, th- and meditate and think about life, you'll realize that most of those things served you in the moment of time. Um, you know, if, if your life is about collecting money, there's going to be a point in your life eventually where you sit back and go, what did I collect all this money for? Um, does it actually serve me? And so you should think about that. And um, anyway... Uh, going to places where you find the you that doesn't think in words. I love this concept because that is, that's something that we should all strive to be. I think that's what really good art and literature and music and movies, that's where that all comes from is the, it speaks to the part of you that doesn't, you know, you can't even describe it in words. It just kind of hits the right moment, the right time. Um, we're all searching for those feelings. We all would rather live a life where we're in tune with that more than we aren't. 
Um, Brian, the author, mentions that you see thing you see the same thing in Kabbalism, Sufism, which is sort of uh, Islamic mystical tradition, and Christian mysticism. Um, all these questions and the things surrounding these questions. Um, that is the idea that you go within yourself, but remove yourself for an instant, and that's where you find the divine. Um, some of this stuff I'm quoting directly from the podcast, but this is sort of the topics that were covered. Um, it, it's all within an attempt to discover pure awareness. What does this all mean? It, they get into ideas of if the universe is generated by people's awareness and attention and a little bit in that podcast, they go over simulation theory. Um, so, you know, a little bit after that, Brian brings up Terrence McKenna. And my ears sort of prick up because I've listened to a lot of Terrence McKenna. And if you are listening to this, you don't know who that is. You should, like, stop this video and go Google him and watch. Just listen to him, to Terrence McKenna speak. Um, he passed away in the year 2000, I want to say. Um, but he's just the topics he covers are amazing um so terence mckenna had this idea of discarnate entities and archons and aliens and archetypes um Marascu, brian Marascu says that this is where mckenna meets plato in plato's world of the invisible college where humans have a symbiosis and ideas come to us in ancient literature and also when people take psychedelics. And when they started describing archons, they get into it a little bit with all these UFO sightings that it possibly could be that people are seeing um, supernatural beings that people in the past have called archons that may or may not be real. They may be just visions. They may be you know, hallucinations from people's minds, but if they start to stack up and they're happening in modern day and we don't really have explanations for them, could this be what ancient literature has sort of talked about, which are, you know, whether you're taking psychedelics or it's a hallucination or it's a real thing, it's all pointing towards spiritual beings that are above us, outside of us, operating in the real world. And, you know, McKenna talks about this with, he, he firmly believed that when you take certain substances like DMT and you go into another realm, you're seeing other entities, discarnate entities. Um, you know, I don't know if that idea is, uh, has a, a basis in reality, what we would call objective reality, but it's certainly fun to think about. Um, the Archon's concept is fascinating, um, I, you know. In this channel, if you've been paying attention, I read a book called Applied Magic by Dion Fortune. I read the audiobook. It's available in the public domain. Pretty short book. I think it's like 90 pages long. And so about four and a half hours. And that was written in the 1960s. And Dion Fortune um, believed she was an occult uh, witch, I guess, in England. And she had a cadre of mages around her. And they got into... What they, what they believed to be spiritual, psychological battles with other practitioners of black magic. And um, I don't know much of the history beyond that, but that is a book I read. <laughs> and on this channel, you could find it and got quite popular. And she discusses these archons. She calls them elementals. And these elementals are, you know, if you have a crowd, a group of people... And you can control what the group of people is thinking or feeling. And, you know, we know some of this by group psychology and how crowd, the psychology of crowds, they're kind of influential. If you have four or five members within the crowd spread out and they all say, you know, let's start a riot or let's, you know, attack the stage or um, break down this barrier and the kind of the the psychology of the crowd they'll all start to move in the same direction and you know they just you you will find you could know all this information you'll still find yourself in a crowd following what the rest of the people around you are doing it's just a a, a thing of psychology and she calls if a magician is able to manipulate 
these elementals that that is how they can perform uh, grand things. So she mentions elementals that can result from controlling a crowd. And they can alter the physical world. Um, I find this an interesting concept. Even if you take all the woo-woo BS out of it, um, there's something very interesting occurring when groups of people get together. Um, something interesting in the psychology of crowds and that the fact that they're very suggestible. Um, the author Brian then ties what one sees on psychedelic trips as seeing... He sort of puts this idea out that what Plato was talking about with Plato's archetypes, um, roughly speaking, uh, Plato had the you know the world of reality versus the world of ideals. So if you imagine a perfect table um, in your mind, you can imagine a table and you can make it the perfect table. Is that real, or is the table that you see in front of you um, is is you know, when a carpenter puts together a table, are they trying to make the idealized form of the table? Or is that just forever in our minds? And if it's in my mind, can I share it with you in your mind? And that's kind of where the allegory of the cave, the matrix, that's where all that comes from. So you have to confront the world that is more real than real. And then they go on to talk about psychedelics in ancient Greece. Very interesting topics. Whenever I hear people talk about this, of course, I'm going to like pick up the book and read it. And I, I did, and I found the book, the book had two parts to it. And I got a really good history into ancient Greece and Roman history. The first of two parts explains how America, the whole book starts out that America is both Greek and Christian at the same time. And this is kind of strange because although America, we got democracy, we got some of our buildings in Washington, D.C., we got the concept and the word the Senate, um, the Republic, the fact that we're a Republic, we got many ideas from ancient Greece. We got, you know, the ability to reason, geometry, um, all sorts of things. And we still respect the great thinkers and the first philosophers from from that time period. And then we tie it together with sort of the values of Christianity. We think democracy is sort of, there's something to be, how you tie it to Christianity and Christian values. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And, you know, sort of, it's a very, our founding fathers were, were deists. Uh, they sort of followed the Christian tradition. And in a lot of ways, even now in 2022, America feels like a Christian nation. Um, when you go up in our judicial system and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, you put your hand on a Bible and it's somehow symbolically meant to, you know, you are under oath. And that's a spiritual concept that says, you know, between, you know, in front of your country, in front of your God, in front of yourself and in front of everyone you know all the people and the public you are telling the truth right now and it's it's a a big taboo and a big violation if you lie under oath and it's just you know some things change it's a weird is it psychological spiritual just alteration if you watch someone tell you something and then you put them under under oath like in a deposition or in a court you know giving testimony people's stories will change because they they just understand that they have to speak the truth now. Now, sometimes people lie, and that's egregious. You know, there's egregious results that occur after that. But um, so, anyways, that's that's sort of how America is both Greek and Christian. But the author goes on to say that for most of history, these two, Greek and Christianity, were opposed. Greek came by way before. And then Christianity came in, you know, 2,000, 20 years ago, roughly, uh, and a little bit after that, because uh, as, you know, goes into, the author goes into the history of the Gospels and how they were written and at what point they were adapted into uh, what we call the New Testament, which was fascinating because, as we probably know, the Old Testament was a series of oral traditions and eventually it was written down. 
And then the New Testament was not the four Gospels um, were chosen amongst many Gospels. And the Gospels that were not chosen were sort of hidden away. And we've recently, since the 70s, um, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, uncovered the Gnostic Gospels. So the Gospels of the disciples that were not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John from the New Testament. And so the New Testament, doc, um, the four Gospels, were written about 100 years after Jesus died. So they were sort of a, a mythological um, a, accounting of, but written by people. So the people that wrote it down got the account from the disciples who were around Jesus but it was, you know, it's at least twice removed at that point. And then it was written in, the majority of the New Testament was written in Greek, but then it was translated to Latin. And then it was stayed in Latin for many years before in the 1600s, it was translated to English. And then it was Old English, that's sort of the King James version of the Bible, where all the modern day um, translations of the New Testament, of the Bible were translated from, you know, into new English. Um, so they have the new international version of the Bible. So you have Christian values, which the Catholic Church, which first started to become a thing in around year 350 AD. Now, the Catholic Church was around before that, but that's when they were, um, you know, Emperor Constantine... Uh, made it the official religion and it changed became much more institutionalized and became the massive you know number one world religion that it is today uh, because of the Catholic Church because of the Roman Catholic Church and the the interesting part is that the Romans were you know the early Christian Church it was a secret religion it was an underground religion and it wasn't um you know it wasn't popular it wasn't it, it was it was uh kept secretive and it, it had nothing to do with the ancient greek tradition that was sort of the ancient greek tradition led into the roman uh empire the roman empire was sort of opposed to the christian empire but then as i mentioned around year 350 the roman the roman empire adopted christianity as uh the the dominant religion and it went from there so that is all to say that the early Christian church probably looked a lot different than the Catholic church that we have today. And then, of course, all the Protestant, um, you know, schisms that happened off of off of the, the main church. So America is sort of influenced by both. And we think the, that both historically were tied together when that's not actually the case at all. And if you look back into history, the two were very different up until about year 350. And then since then, the two have been merged together and it creates modern day America in the 1700s. But um, the the two ideas were very opposed. So finding the part one, he talks about finding the history of the Greek Kukion. So the Kukion was this secretive um, drink that not many people knew about. Okay, if you watch the movie 300, there are the oracles of Delphi, and they're sort of mystical beings that took psychedelics and gave, they had visions, and that's sort of known about, but the author points towards ancient Greek literature, um, stuff on potteries, on pottery, ancient texts, all, various sources that are uh, noted in the book and he ties together and says the Greeks probably believed that wine it wasn't to make people drunk it was a psychedelic in nature and so they called this the kukion and it worked uh, he came about this hypothesis working off of other people in the classics tradition and it was how people died before they actually died the many famous figures in Greek history attended secret rituals on the island of I Icaria. And, you know, like people like Marcus Aurelius or um, certain Greek philosophers, uh, Pythagoras, people like that, 
they all went there, like the celebrities of the day, and they all went to this one island and died before they actually died. They all had a psychedelic experience drinking this wine. So he he puts together evidence of there, and I'm I'm not educated to know whether he's right in that, but I know it's just an interesting idea, and he he does do his due diligence, and um, you get a little history lesson um, from it too. All right, part two, um, and then we'll wrap up the video. So part two ties the idea of psychedelic, this psychedelic kukion, to the early Christian church. And then the author goes on to say that this was wiped out by the Catholic church, the institution. Um, really interesting proof in the book, but I will say this is such a radical claim that I was not convinced by it. I think it's highly interesting in 2022 to make a radical claim that you can track between the ancient uh, practice of psychedelic wine and consumption to the early Christian church through using the Eucharist. Um, and they said, you know, if you drink the blood of Jesus, you will experience divine power and be able to see God. I certainly like the idea. I think it's very fascinating. I've participated in, you know, growing up in, in a Protestant church, I've experienced a uh, communion and I certainly, uh, if you had told me at that time that this would, you know, this, this came from an ancient tradition where people literally took psychedelics and it changed your mind. I just would have been like, that's crazy. And, and nobody around me would have believed that either. And so it's, it's really hard to prove a hypothesis like that. It's very enticing. And that sort of makes me skeptical in a way because it's, it's almost too crazy to be true. Like there's almost no way that early people were taking drugs underground and then it became the national religion. But it's certainly fun to think that way. I'm, I've never heard of this hypothesis elsewhere. Um, so sort of for me, the jury's out on part two. Uh, oh, there's a, throughout the book, the pagan continuity hypothesis. So this is the idea that because the Roman, uh, church was pagan in nature and paganism is a, you know, as I've come to learn a series of, you know, religious practices and they involve the sun, the stars, the moon, plants, making sacrifices at certain parts of the day. I'm sure I'm butchering it. If, if someone knows more than I do, uh, I'm certainly not giving a a good overview of what pagan liter, uh, religion is, but from what I know about it, the Christian tradition um, in around the year 350 or so uh, kind of continued the pagan tradition and just incorporated a bunch of um, updated Christian values to it. So that's why we celebrate... Um, Christmas on December 25th, which was historically the birthday of the sun god, Sol. So, yeah, I mean, you could find more interesting on, uh, you can find more information on this kind of stuff in different people's YouTube channels, but I wanted to mention that that was spoken about in this book. Um, okay, I see that we're running about 38 minutes, so I'm going to wrap the video up. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that I've provided sort of a clear, concise um, bit of, of examples and explanation onto my thoughts on this book. I would definitely recommend that if you've liked this, these few minutes of me talking about the concepts within, you're going to, you're going to love this book. And it's, I, I just can appreciate a clear author that they're saying exactly what they're trying to say. They know it's a radical claim but he just backs it up by evidence and you learn a lot when you read this book. I would highly recommend it. I give it like a five out of five. It does go into repeating. The author repeats himself at certain times, but when you're making radical claims, it's sort of helpful to keep you into the book. Um, I, I picked it up and read it over vacation and I, I couldn't put it down. I had it done in like a few days. So it's a, like 440 pages and I hope you enjoy. If you have any comments or questions, um, if you want me to go into you know, more clarification on things, I'd be happy to do so. Please leave a comment below. 
and thank you so much for your attention on this. All right, see you next time.